three, two, one, and we're live once again. Welcome to HeroQuest fans. As often happens, I'm here to talk about a bunch of issues related to HeroQuest and actually related games. I don't want anybody to think that I've lost my passion for HeroQuest specifically in all its forms, but I do have a lot of interest in these related games. So I've talked in the past about Battle Masters, I've talked about Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer 40,000 or 40k. I've talked about Space Crusade, also known as Star Quest. And the reason I bring these up is, well, let me explain something. So maybe a little story would, uh, would kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. So imagine you're a little kid growing up and you really like The Wizard of Oz. You like The Wizard of Oz movie. MGM, Judy Garland, musical, fantasy, it's great, right? Then, a few years later, you, after you've seen the movie a million times, you find out that it's actually based on a book. And so you read the book, or you ask your parents to read the book to you, and you discover that the story it's based on is a little bit different than what you remember. And some things you like about the book better, and some things that you like about the movie better. But they're two different kind of versions of the same story. Fast forward to your adulthood. Imagine that for the first time you realize actually back in the day when The Wizard of Oz was written there were actually sequels. Did you know that? There was uh, over a dozen books written by the original author that were sequels to the original story. And the vast majority of these never have been <laughs> have never been made into any other form, so they didn't come out as movies, they didn't get turned into plays or anything like that. Now, in the case of this illustration I'm making, The Wizard of Oz did have sequels. There were cartoons, there were silent films. They weren't nearly as famous as the MGM musical. Uh, but you had The Return to Oz in the 80s, which uh, combined the plots of the second and third books and a lot of people didn't like it because even though it kind of built itself as a sequel to the movie, there were some differences in tone, there really weren't any songs or dance numbers, so it was a completely different uh, experience. It's more like a horror movie or a kind of a, almost like a, a Tim Burton, like, weird kind of thriller for kids, fairy tale story. So. When I look at HeroQuest, it's kind of like that for me, because for me, HeroQuest was the game. Growing up, as a kid, it was this really cool board game that I didn't even own. It was actually my brother's, but we played it together, and then many years later, I rediscovered it, we rediscovered it, dusted it off, found the online community, decided to start making you know, custom customized little things, you know, besides just making our own quests, but making new characters and all kinds of things. Well, I don't have the same nostalgia for, let's say, Battle Masters or Space Crusade, but I was curious about them because these were games that were a lot less popular and a lot less visible. I mean, I kind of remember the commercial for um, Battle Masters and if thinking, well, I've already got Hero Quest. Hero Quest is good enough. And by the time Battle Masters was coming out, I really wasn't that interested in it. But over time, I kind of got more interested. I read more about it. I thought, you know, it'd be kind of neat to check that out. And it was so hard to find and so expensive that I thought, well, that's never going to happen. But lo and behold, I found a fairly good deal online and thought, okay, I'll get it. And then you've seen a couple of videos here on HeroQuest fans where I kind of take it to tinkering with it and kind of trying to restore it. And I've actually played it and thought, yeah, it's pretty fun. But, as I've said before, Battle Masters is a very different game than HeroQuest. HeroQuest is a tabletop fantasy dungeon crawler board game. Battle Masters is a war game, a simplified war game. But Battle Masters is kind of like a simplified Warhammer fantasy battle. And HeroQuest is kind of like taking that idea, but compressing it down into a Dungeons & Dragons style board game. Even though Dungeons & Dragons is its own thing, maybe a better comparison is Advanced Hero Quest or Warhammer Quest. So, 
Games Workshop who is in charge of Citadel miniatures and design the miniatures that are in all these games but not the remake version of Hero Quest last year um, they are still making these miniatures so you've got uh, Warhammer Fantasy Age of Sigmar and you've got Warhammer 40,000 and then before that you had Warhammer Fantasy Battle and Warhammer Fantasy RPG which was actually from the 80s I corrected something I said in an earlier stream I thought I was getting confused with the second edition because all these games have multiple editions it's a little bit confusing if you're not a super fan so since I am only learning about Battle Masters recently it doesn't have the same nostalgia pull that HeroQuest does I can't speak with it speak about it with the same authority that I can Hero Quest. So it's not me saying, hey, back in the day I used to. It's, well, me right now, as a grown-up, learning about this old game that was released in my childhood that I didn't play back then. So there's definitely experts out there. And that leads me to my next point. So Space Crusade is a game that I've become recently interested in. And I know it's related to an earlier game called Space Hulk which is kind of like Advanced Hero Quest, in the sense that I think it has modular dungeon pieces, and it's a futuristic questing game. And Space Hulk, in turn, is inspired by and based in the universe, loosely, of Warhammer 40,000. So, all these other games I've had to learn about recently. So again, I don't have the same nostalgia, don't have the same authority, knowledge, I'm basically just giving myself a crash course in this. So, as you can see on your screen there, uh, there's a YouTube channel, Always Bored, Never Boring. Uh, I see this guy's stuff, I'm subscribed to him, so a little free plug for him. Um, he has done a lot of videos about Space Crusade. And so, if you're looking for somebody who's going to give you that nostalgic perspective, who knows a lot about it, who plays it, who modifies it, all that, go to him check him out what you're gonna get in this channel is my perspective as an old-school hero quest fan who is discovering these games now as opposed to somebody who knew it all along so I don't want to mislead anybody and think that I'm trying to be you know the person who knows about every game or something as if I'm an expert on them so I'm still learning this stuff I'm probably gonna make a lot of mistakes but for me, it's kind of fun just learning about it. Just finding out how players reacted to these games at the start, how they modified them, how they tried to collect them. So that's I enjoy that part. And so part of me is just enjoying the thrill of discovery. And so if I make mistakes along the way, that's fine. Because, yeah, I could just, just, just keep my mouth shut, let these other guys talk about it, because they clearly know more than I do. Um, I know HeroQuest. But I'm learning Space Crusade, I'm learning Battle Masters. I'm learning Warhammer Fantasy, even though I kind of don't want to get into that game just because of the sheer cost involved. You don't have the kind of time to paint an entire army like that. Same thing with Warhammer 40,000. The reason I want to learn about those games is because of the connections to Hero Quest, because of the background, which I think is pretty interesting. I like taking bits and pieces of the story, the setting, the characters and kind of massaging them and squeezing them into my own storylines. Because, yeah, Hero Quest isn't big on story. It's mostly just a dice-rolling, card-flipping game where you move pieces around a board. It's a board game. Battle Masters, we're flipping cards and moving stuff around. Space Crusade, the same way. Um, but I, I'm going to share some interesting little things that I learned about these games. But first, I'm going to check the chat to make sure that I'm not missing anything anybody's saying. So while I'm waiting for these deliveries, because in the age of COVID and supply line issues, um, it's it's always kind of a gamble when you order something through the mail. It's like, is it going to arrive? Is it going to be delayed? Who knows when it's really going to show up? So it always seems like I'm waiting for some package or the other, something to talk about. Let me just check the chat here real quick. But yeah, always bored, never boring on YouTube. I recommend them. Check them out. I think he's actually called Kevin Outlaw. I don't know if that's his real name. Could be. Okay, nothing there in the Discord. 
Yeah, check us out on Discord. gaze into infinity let's see okay so we've got droop dog and we've got Lee or Leck okay, so that's the first time I've tried to pronounce your name out loud Lee or Leck so I know at least one of you is a veteran of the discord droop dog I think I've seen before but anyway welcome to both of you so yeah, let's check some things out. So yeah, um, always bored, never boring. Shout out to him. I mean, look at all these videos he's got. I disagree with him on Battle Foam. I think Battle Foam is a big waste of cash. But you spend your money on what you want. Of course. First world problems. A couple things I want to say about just some recent developments. So, as many of you know, HeroQuest is in retail with the uh, remake version. That's pretty obvious. That's That's been happening for all of January. And so if you want to buy the reprinted version of Hero Quest and Keller's Keep and Return of the Witch Lord, you can get them from all these different retailers pretty easily. It's a little more expensive than it was during the pledge drive and all the mythic tier stuff other than what I just mentioned is not available unless you buy it from a reseller, which I don't recommend doing. I don't recommend lining the pockets of some scalper on eBay. I mean, no offense to those people, of course, but the um, Sir Ragnar, Witchlord, um, the Mentor Wizard Replacement, the Warlock, Druid, and the Bard, and the Joe Manginello Dragon, the alternate gender swapped heroes and alternate gender swapped monsters the prophecy of Telor by Stephen Baker quest book the Joe Manginello Crypt of Perpetual Darkness and the Teos Abadia uh, Spirit Queen's Torment book all that stuff was only in the pledge version of the Hero Quest remake and you can't buy it anymore unless you get it from a reseller so unfortunately Hasbro has decided not to release that stuff at this time to the public Avalon Hill, their subsidiary, is has the game system, Keller's Keep Return of the Witch Lord, in retail. And apparently that was all their focus. So presumably, just like you can buy your Access and Allies, and Clue, and all these other games, you can keep buying HeroQuest. You don't have to track down somebody's you know overpriced boosted copy from the pledge drive from last year. So, anyway, I think that's a good thing. But, the hero expansion, uh, Commander of the Guardian Knights, which is just a little box that has two red miniatures in them, a male and a female knight, um, and 12 cards, six for each character. That package, which was $15, is really hard to find. And from my time spent on, on the phone with customer service, or GameStop and Hasbro has proven to me that it's a supply chain issue whether they come out and say it or not so what seems to be have happened is people placed their pre-orders back in November and people who hang out at Yield and know all this and it's probably really boring and they're <laughs> hoping that I'll get done with saying this so that I can say something more interesting but I just wanted to get it out there that this Commander of the Guardian Knights thing is still coming out people that pre-ordered are still getting their figures but it, I guess they got, they ran out of stock in November. That was the original release date. I think it was November 30th. So they ran out of stock. They got some more in this month. And it seems like they've already run out of stock again. At least, I got mine from GameStop. I'll never do that again. But anyway, yeah. So they ran out of stock and now they're saying March. Some people are saying that they were told April. So April Fool. <laughs> but yeah. So it seems like. A little bit more comes in, they, they distribute them to the people that ordered, and then they run out again and get some more. A lot of this is speculation because they're pretty tight-lipped. But I understand, you, if you work for a big company, they put you in a customer service position, they put you in the tight spot of, you can't tell the customers anything, all you can say is, I'm sorry, please be patient, oh, you want a refund, okay, fine, here's how you do that. So I'm still waiting for my nights. 
But I know what they look like. I've seen videos because reviewers got them early. People that were reviewing them. But I'm not a reviewer. I don't get paid for the stuff. I don't get uh, free promo stuff. So I find out things the same way everybody else does. And just give my personal perspective. You may disagree. But uh, just check the chat real quick. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. If anybody wants to fire any questions off, you know, within reason, see if I can address them. Oh yeah, I'm just looking at the user list, not the regular chat. Let's see. So any questions, fire away. Okay, so yeah, back to uh, back to my example. So Wizard of Oz, you find out that there's all these other books besides the Wizard of Oz you grew up with. You find out there's other movies, obscure as they may be. So for me, it's kind of like that's what my Hero Quest journey is like, is that I'm finding out there were other games made by the same people, maybe set in the same universe, maybe with similar features, and I'm discovering them as if I'm a kid again way back then, but I have the knowledge of an adult, I have the bank account of an adult, and so if I want to explore them, I can. Although, it is kind of like a, a quest, a treasure hunt, because you're looking for these games, trying to find you know a copy that's reasonably priced, that isn't totally broken, and trying to, try to play it. So a couple of recent threads I saw on Yieldin that I enjoyed, I wanted to bring your attention to. First, let me refresh to see if there's any updates since then. Okay, so some new people are streaming in. Oh yeah, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so talking about StarQuest, and again, StarQuest is not just a futuristic version of HeroQuest, like the Flintstones and the Jetsons. It's actually its own game, and supposedly Stephen Baker who is credited or credits himself as the inventor of HeroQuest, even though it was a collaborative effort, you know, not to downplay anybody else's contributions. It all came together in the perfect storm of a game back in 1989-90. Um, he says that StarQuest or Space Crusade is actually his favorite of all the games that he's worked on or had a hand in designing. So he was involved with HeroQuest, with Space Crusade, aka StarQuest, Hero Escape, which I've never played. I've seen the pieces in stores, but I've never played them. Battle Masters. Um, I think it's Lord of the Rings Risk. Uh, I'm probably forgetting one or two games. And then some obscure game about dinosaurs. Which, believe it or not, there is this German game where you ride dinosaurs. They're little plastic miniatures on a rectangular board, and you roll dice. And apparently it's a really goofy game, the rules aren't very uh, polished, but it's probably a ton of fun if you're a little kid, because what's cooler than having plastic models of dinosaurs that have armor, and little tribesmen that ride them, and you got to roll dice to see who wins. Because that's really how Stephen Baker got his start, is he was a guy, he worked in a game shop part-time, I think, and when he was a kid, he had like to just kind of get his toys together and figure out, okay, well, if we roll dice and we give this guy some stats, this is how he can fight, rather than just, okay, you bash your army men together and say, I, I won, <laughs> which is how most kids do it. You know? It's like, okay, I build this Lego fort, this is how much strength it actually has, and so forth. And eventually he becomes one of these big game designer people, figures in the community of fantasy board gaming. But anyway, back to StarQuest. So, I think I've mentioned this before. There are regional differences between some of these games. So we've spent a lot of time talking about HeroQuest, the Japanese version. And again, it's like that kid who discovers all of a sudden the thing, well, when they grow up, the thing that they liked as a kid has all these sequels they didn't know about. So... With the Japanese game, it's like there's 14 new quests I never knew existed. There's a whole different magic system that I never knew about. And so it's like you're discovering Hero Quest for the first time, seeing it translated into a language you can understand. And shout out to Hispazargon and all the other people who worked on that. And uh, it's a similar way with 
Space Crusade. Because, as I mentioned before, Space Crusade is based in the universe of Warhammer 40,000, also called Warhammer 40K. Just like HeroQuest is loosely based on the universe of Warhammer Fantasy Battle or Warhammer Fantasy RPG. Same formula. Um, but the German version of StarQuest had some differences. And when I read about it, and every time I've read about it online, it's always put in a really derisive way. So I know that some games in video games, board games, whatever, in Germany were heavily censored. Same thing was true of Japan at a certain point in time. It's like if kids are going to be playing this, they can't have killing and bloodshed. So they had to tone it down. So as a grown-up, you're like, ah, oh, get that out of here. I, don't, I want it uncensored. You know, I want the original game in all its gruesome glory. You know, just I can handle it. Give it to me. Okay. I totally understand that. At the same time, though, I think it's interesting that you have this other version of the game. And it's also interesting that it can be looked at. People around the world can kind of compare versions. So just like you have people in the UK who are buying the brand new remake of Hero Quest and playing the North American rules, which are in that 2021 version for the first time, which is different than the one they grew up with, and they can decide, okay, do I like this better? Do I think it's, it's just different? Or do I hate it and I want to go back to the old rules? So um, I can imagine somebody in Germany playing Space Crusade and going, wow, this is so much better than what I had as a kid, because when I as a kid was toned down and censored and you know, um, all the all the sharp corners were kind of sanded off to protect me and everything. Or they might have some nostalgia for the old way. So, but for someone like me, who didn't grow up with this game, I just think it's interesting that there's a variation. So looking at this thread here, so the things I'd read is that, okay, in the German version, they've decided that instead of being space marines who are sent out to attack these uh, ships that are called Space Hulks, so they're kind of like pirate ships in a way, is that the Space Hulk is a, uh, an Imperial ship that went through warp space, it got kind of messed up and filled with these evil chaos creatures, like orcs, space orcs, Gretchen, which are space goblins, uh, gene stealers, or as they're called in a PC game, soul suckers, which are these multi-armed, kind of xenomorph-esque, alien monsters that kind of take over your body and eat you and it I guess it's kind of vaguely similar to like a fimmer but I'm not going to get into the whole reasons for that but it's its, its own thing and then there's androids which are kind of like Terminator robots in the Terminator movies but those get um, later classified as Necrons so I guess the lore kept changing so there's more to say about that. There's Dreadnoughts, which are like the Ed 209 from Robocop, these big bipedal, multi weapon robot things. Which I guess in the lore, they're actually, there's a guy inside. So there's like a, a human body or an alien body inside that's controlling it. So when a warrior gets so beat up that he can't fight anymore, they just take his body or take his brain and they shove it into a machine and send him off to fight some more. So, something like that. So it could be a cyborg. Well, in the German version, they say, no, that's not what it is. The Space Marines aren't genetically modified super soldier humans inside armor fighting these biological uh, monsters to the death. Instead, you're a police force. They call them the GSG. And I, again, I'm learning more and more about this because I have to rely on other people's translations to figure it out because my German is not very good. Uh, I learned it as a kid, but I just, I never really did any immersion or practice, so I'm not very good at it. So I rely on others to translate that stuff, just like I do for the Japanese stuff and everything else. So, sorry if you're one of those multilingual people, I mean, more power to you. But yeah, so some of the things they did was they said that the, the bad guys you're fighting are all robots, and the good guys are all police. So what happens is you're trying to apprehend or disable the robots, and so all the weapons are like non-lethal or less than lethal, which, okay, it's kind of interesting. But they came up with these imaginative ways to convert them into these non-lethal weapons, even though the models are the same. 
even though the artwork is the same. The text is different. It kind of reminds me of what I did with my demagicified world, which you can read about on Yield In. I mean, I tried to create a mod for HeroQuest where you had the same fun, the same variety, but everything was kind of imaginatively converted away from magical to more like tech type stuff, but like ancient tech. So it was alchemy, like uh, medieval science. Whereas in this case, they're converting uh, soldiers into military police or police, space police against robots. So one of the things they did, they uh, so the chaos robots, okay, so I guess the uh, orcs are just monstrous looking robots. And you have a thing called a zero time gun, which fires time bubbles. And this has been humorously covered by many other channels on YouTube already. So uh, I think Squidmar, yeah, Squidmar is this guy, I'm trying to think what country he's from. He might be from Germany. Well, anyway, he's from somewhere in Europe. Sorry if you're listening, Squidmar, but he uh, did a humorous little animation about how you know, they toned down the violence in Star Quest, which are basically just teleporting the, the uh, bad guys out of there rather than killing them. Well, anyway, so we've got the Zero Time Gun, and that replaces what's called the Auto Cannon in uh, uh, Space Crusade. I keep wanting to call it Space Quest. It's not Space Quest, it's Star Quest. And actually, the video game was called Space Crusade as well. There are video games called Star Quest, but they have nothing to do with the board game. This is uh, an attempt to create the board game in a computer game format, just like the Gremlin HeroQuest PC game. You know what I mean? But some people have said that Space Crusade makes a better video game than it does a board game, whereas HeroQuest makes a better board game than a computer game. But you can judge for yourself. So I was curious about some of this stuff, so I'm just going to talk some more about Space Crusade things. Let's check the chat. Not a lot of chatter from Discord, that's okay. First time chatter. Oh. So we have a problem with the audio. I've been talking about Space Crusade aka StarQuest, and some of the differences in the German version. So I'm going to kind of speed this along. So, some of the other differences. Yeah, the zero time cannon is instead of the auto cannon. And as Andras, who is a great uh, prolific poster and mod maker on Yield In for HeroQuest, he knows a lot about Space Crusade, and he mentions the Black Hole Blaster, which replaces the Plasma Gun. Now the Plasma Gun is, is called the Flamer, I believe, in Warhammer 40k. Again, all this stuff is, oops, all this stuff is from 40k, so it's like a futuristic war game. And he talks about how the bolter, so you get a weapon called a bolter, which is either a pistol or a, I don't know if you call it a carbine. It's kind of like an Uzi, actually, so a submachine gun fires explosive uh, rounds. So in the German version of Star Quest, they make it a laser. They don't say how it is not lethal, but that's what they call it. And the rocket launcher, they change to a hollow projector. And the GSG, he thinks it stands for Galactic Protection Group, but it's actually the name of a real German special police unit. So that, that part's interesting. So I'm just going to look at a couple other things here. So the missile launcher... Okay, yeah, this is from another website. So Sergeant Alls is the credit for this. The missile launcher is called a hollow werfer. This weapon would project illusionary foes to confound the aliens in the space hole. Outnumbered on all sides by these phantasms, they would fight them in a futile effort until they were exhausted, and as a consequence, removed from the board. I don't know It's an illusion. Yeah, the assault cannon and or minigun was the Nulzite cannon. It would slow down aliens in such a way that they would no longer pose a threat to anybody in their vicinity. Plasma gun is called the black hole blaster. 
the last cannon, which is short for laser cannon, is called a time twister. It would transport the aliens either into the past or the future. <laughs> I like his quippy little jokes here. And then the multi melta is called a fusions cannon. cannon. It would melt the feet of the aliens to the Space Hulk's floor. Space Hulk is the abandoned ship that was taken over by the aliens. And the 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 evil wizard player, as I would call, you know, Zargon or Morkar controlling the, the bad guys in Space Crusade or Star Quest is called the alien player. So he's the the alien commander, the alien warlord, what do you call him? Hey alien. <laughs> hey alien, put your stuff out. But anyway. Um, the conversion beam is known as the degressor. It would alter the alien mind chemistry to become docile, harmless creatures. <laughs> the power glove, which has nothing to do with the Nintendo power glove, is called the shakhen shu. It would incapacitate aliens the same way that a taser would. And the power sword is called a KO Schwert. A knockout sword. So just knock them out. And the vulture is the laser. Okay, and then another quote says, first of all, the aliens were summed up under the name of Robotlings. Interesting. Robotlings. Gene Stealers became clones, and the Necrons became androids. Actually, they were androids in the original. Funniest change is about the Marines, and he points out, yeah, they're known as the Blood Angels, which are the red figures, the Imperial Fists, which are the yellow ones, and the Ultramarines, which are blue, which is straight out of Warhammer 40k, but they're called the Galaxy Safeguard, or GSG for short, which is an anti-terror unit in Germany, so that's interesting. They were known as the GSG Tigers. GSG Musketeers and the GSG 19. Because the GSG is a special unit formed by the Human Federation who now lives in peace and prosperity, they do not kill. That's why they use special non lethal guns. So that's the quote. The black hole gun opens a portal which sucks the enemy robotlings into another dimension where they can't hurt them, while the null time cannon froze time around. The GSG commanders also had special non lethal weapons like the KO Sword. Okay, so now we get to the part where I started having fun about it. Um, so you could call this the de-violenceify, de-killify uh, version of Space Crusade or Star Quest. You could come up with a story that makes sense for this if you wanted to play this way, because the gameplay doesn't change at all. It's just a stylistic choice. Maybe you want to tone it down for little kids you're playing with, or... You just want to change the story. So these space police. So I had a lot of fun because what I did was just check the chat. I mean, I check the chat periodically. Okay, I think it's me. No audio for minutes, then a second or two of sound before it cuts out again. So I apologize, Lee or Lick. I'm gonna have to listen to it um, on YouTube, and if some parts are bad, I'll just cut those out. Maybe re record some parts. So let me just check the sound. Okay. Yeah. So I can hear there's kind of a hum in the background. It's because I'm running a fan. And there's a little, it's just a little bit hollow, but otherwise it's working pretty well on my end. So I'm, I'm sorry for that. But thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Always more the merrier, I say. Okay, so back to StarQuest. Okay, so what I did was I tracked down, and it wasn't easy. Don't ask me how I did it, but the first edition of Warhammer 40,000, I thought, okay, just like with HeroQuest, how I wanted to go to the version of the game that inspired it, most likely. So for HeroQuest, it was Warhammer Fantasy Battle 3rd Edition. It was, that's the one that was current as of 1989 when HeroQuest first came out. So I went back and read that. I mean, I didn't read it cover to cover, I skimmed it. 
I skimmed it looking for details, some stuff that I thought, I looked it up. It's like, okay, how does this compare to my impression of the game? How does this compare to HeroQuest's interpretation of it? And so I kind of used things that I thought were cool and added them to my own world, so to speak. So I tried to do a similar thing with Space Crusade. Because I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be buying this game, playing this game, and I want to see where it came from. So I knew the game came out in 1990, and I wanted to find the inspiration. So the first edition of Warhammer 40K, as we know it today, was called Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader, which is Rogue Trader. And again, this is not a game I grew up playing. So if you're an expert on that game and I say something wrong, I want you to correct me in the comments and I'll acknowledge it and correct myself. And so as I'm learning more and more about it, it's kind of interesting. So the whole storyline, oh yeah, and the book that I was reading, it actually says 1987, but the edition says 1990. So I don't know if there were any changes in those couple of years between the initial printing and the, the edition I was looking at, but it's the earliest one I could find. So the story is that the Emperor is an immortal. Like, I didn't realize this. He was an immortal, not in the sense that he actually does live forever, but he's a human who lived on Earth and like way back in prehistoric times and he lived all this time apparently like Highlander I guess and into, into the far future he becomes the Emperor he gathers humanity together so he's like a really important figure in this fantasy universe and he has psychic powers and in that mythos the lore for this game they call them psychers and psychers have this natural ability to like sense things or do telekinesis or whatever. They have they're mentalists, and their power apparently comes from warp space. And the thing about warp space, though, is that that's where the chaos gods live. So you remember when we're talking about Warhammer Fantasy? In that one, the chaos gods are like followed by the chaos warriors, and there's chaos magic and all that stuff. But it's kind of like, I'm not exactly sure how the two universes connect. It's one the future of the other, one the past of the other. It's not 100% clear, and I guess when new editions of these games come out, they contradict stuff that was in previous editions, or they leave out stuff, or they add new things. So I guess if you're a fan, you probably have your own headcanon version of the game that you think is the best and makes the most sense. And there's hundreds and thousands of articles and wiki pages and everything explaining all this history and how they think it makes sense. But how the original authors intended, who knows. You know? So I'm just going by what the book was saying. Is that, so the Emperor, he has this long life, but his son betrays him and stages a coup and so they fight a civil war and he, I think he has to kill his son in battle. His son is named Horus and he's mortally wounded and he has to like sit on his throne but his throne has all this like technology in it because he uses his mind to guide spaceships through the warp of course every time they go through the warp then the chaos gods send their evil aliens through to attack everybody and then there's Eldar, which are like space elves, and their civilization was destroyed by something called Slanish, which is another one of these chaos gods. And the survivors of that war go around in these things called craft worlds, which are like little flying planet ships. And when Eldar die, they store their soul in like this uh, database, so to speak, because they're afraid that otherwise when they die, the chaos gods will get them. And so they don't like chaos either, and they're fighting, and the Emperor is fighting chaos. But yeah, so he gets he gets mortally wounded, and in, instead of just dying like a hero, he plugs himself into the, the throne, which keeps him alive. And I guess the point was, okay, he's still going to keep ruling the Empire. But eventually his body is just decaying. He's just like a mummy. And so the, the whole grim, dark, pessimistic outlook of the universe is, okay... 
the guy that everybody worships and the guy that everybody follows is just a dead body. Like, he's not really there. He doesn't really approve of what's going on. Everybody just assumes. So it's like a superstition. And so it's like, what am I fighting for? This is terrible. But in Space Crusade, they don't get into any of that. Um, instead, it's like, hey, the Emperor's a good guy. You're fighting on his behalf. You're doing these peacekeeping missions, fighting these alien threats, and that's all you need to know. And with the Eldar, yes, your civilization was destroyed by Slanish. Who is Slanish? Don't know. But you're out there fighting these chaos creatures, and you see the Space Marines, and you know you can make an alliance with them. You're fighting them for the same cause. It's great. So, kind of like how Hero Quest doesn't get into all the details of Warhammer Fantasy, it's like you don't need to know that stuff. But if you want to put it into your story and your quest, you can. Well, what I like about Rogue Trader and what I like about Warhammer Fantasy 3rd Edition is they say explicitly in the book, you don't have to use all our ideas. This is the, these are the ideas we came up with. If you want to change it, you can. So I know that there's fans out there that would say, no, you know, you're betraying the lore if you change anything. Which I guess would mean they don't like Hero Quest and they don't like Space Crusade because they're different in some ways. And you've got the remake of Hero Quest, which kind of dodges the Warhammer copyrights by changing the names of things, changing some of the concepts, changing the art, but retaining the core gameplay. Well, I don't see it like that. I just see it as these are just variations of the same stuff. You, know, you do what's fun for your gaming table and what your imagination will allow. But I still like to know what it is they had in mind when they were making these games. So I think the GSG Tigers thing is really interesting. And let's say I was going to continue with that theme. So forget about the Dead Emperor for a minute. You know, that I have all kinds of interesting ideas. But the, the Dead Emperor thing, that was in place apparently back in 1987. So it's not something I had read. What I would read was different. Maybe it's because it was a different edition. But I thought that the game started out saying that he's a real living person who's running the Empire, and you're doing missions for him. And the idea that he was just a corpse plugged into a machine that's, like, using his soul, or his advisors are pretending that his soul is still working, and they're just sacrificing other psychers through his, his corpse to make it look like he's guiding spaceships, and just making up stories saying that, oh, he's fighting the Chaos Gods off in space somewhere. You know, like this deified hero. That, I thought that was introduced later, but it looks like it was there from the beginning. But, anyway, um, I guess Space Crusade is taking place in a time where that should be the case, if you're trying to synchronize the two. But I think in my world, I, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do, but I did have some interesting thoughts. As I was going through this Rogue Trader book from 1987, or 1990, it was showing that actually there's a whole plethora, a whole arsenal of weapons that you can use that are non-lethal or less than lethal. Like, it was already in the game. Because I always think of 40k, oh, it's this bloody, grim, pessimistic, fatalistic game, you know, everything's death and destruction. They're actually like, well, you're playing a game, you're not trying to throw away your troops. You're the commander of an army against another guy's army rolling dice on the table. You don't want to just, you know, have everybody get killed. You want them to survive, you want them to win. So you care about your soldiers, you're a commander. So maybe the universe doesn't care, maybe the emperor doesn't care, but you care, you know? And as a soldier, maybe you're a fanatic who just follows orders, maybe you're just a zealot, you know? But still, somebody's looking out for you. So that's kind of interesting. And you can use non-lethal weapons. So you could blast your enemy with a graviton gun, which makes him, the target, heavier, like so he just crumples to the ground and can't move. And then you're supposed to take the piece off the board as if you killed him. But he's not actually dead. So I think that's really, really interesting. You know, I guess it's kind of like Mortal Kombat, how when you beat your opponent, you don't have to kill them with a fatality. You can use a friendship, you know, finishing move. If anybody remembers that from the, from the 90s. Or a babality, you turn him into a baby. That would be an interesting little tidbit. So if you turn a gene stealer into a baby, do they turn into an egg? Uh, with a necron, like, turn into a pile of bolts? What, what would they turn into? Oh, anyway, so these are actual weapons from Rogue Trader. So they're a cannon, 
in one version of this background game from which Space Crusade was inspired, which you could use. These are not in the German version, but if you wanted to introduce non-lethal weapons, here's what you could do. So you got the Graviton Gun, which I already talked about. You've got the Needle Gun, or the Needler. These sound like Unreal Tournament weapons. And actually, I think Unreal Tournament and Doom, Doom, D-O-O-M, and Quake, and StarCraft, you know, these video games, all derive some inspiration from uh, Warhammer 40K. Now that I think about it. Well, anyway, the Needler is a gun that fires darts. And the darts can be tipped with poison that are lethal, but they can also be tipped with non-lethal poisons. So, that's interesting. There's something called a web gun or a heavy webber. fires sticky webbing, so like Spider-Man. Um, and it can either put the target instantly to sleep, so that's the non-lethal, or it just tightens around the, the victim, and if they struggle too much, so like if they're a stupid like a low intelligence monster, they're going to keep struggling and it gets tighter and tighter and crushes them and kills them. So I guess kind of like the Predator. Uh, is it Predator 2 where he has the net gun? Or maybe I'm thinking of Alien vs. Predator. That was a terrible movie. Terrible two movies. Um, another thing is the shotgun. Well, obviously a shotgun can fire pellets, can fire slugs, which are meant to be lethal. But it can also fire these like police type rounds, which have just like gas in them little gas uh, pellets and they have all kinds of gases and so the shotguns can fire gas the grenades rather than just being like a fragmentation grenade or a grenade that you know is poisonous it can release different types of gas so there's psych out gas which disrupts the psionic powers of psychers that's fun to say so the the only ones that use the psych psyker abilities are the eldar the Eldar are supposed to all have weak psychic abilities, but the X-Arch, or X-Arc, which is the commander of the Space Elves and in your squad, um, it's either a five-man or a ten-man squad, um, they're considered psychers, so they have powers, and when they get hit, they can just sacrifice power instead of dying, and they only have one life point. Whereas with Space Marines, they don't get psyker abilities. However, uh, White Dwarf Magazine, which was the official magazine of Citadel Miniatures, might still be out there. I don't know if it's still running, but they were always trying to get you to buy more miniatures, obviously. So they're like, hey, look at this cool little adventure that you could play that uses this pile of miniatures. So one of the ones they came up with had a Space Marine Librarian, which was like a white. He has white armor, and he has Psyker abilities. So it's kind of like a Space Marine version of the X-Arc, or X-Arch. I'm not sure how you say it. Well, anyway, um, so you got those anti psyker gases, which could be in grenade form or it could be like in a shotgun shell um, thing. You've also got knockout gas, no explanation needed. You've got scare gas, so it, I guess it's kind of like the um, scarecrow in Batman. Freaks them out. You've got hallucinogenic gas, so they don't know what's real and what isn't, they're all confused. Just smoke, just like a smoke screen. You got stum gas, which I forget what stum gas actually is. It's S T U M M, but it's different than stun gas. It's like a riot control type of thing. There's tangle foot, which I think just ruins their coordination, they fall over. There's haywire, that's what they call it, haywire, which is like an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. So the haywire is supposed to disrupt electronics. So if you got a robot, you got a computer. So any mechanical stuff. Chris, you also think, well, what if you shot, like, a biological? Let's say you shot an orc with it. Would his, like, his laser gun stop working? Of course, I guess if he's just got a bolter, it probably would still work, because it's not a computer. But anyway, then there's stasis. So just puts him into stasis. And then what they call a crack, which is really interesting. So you throw a grenade, and it explodes, but instead of just blowing the target up or hitting them with shrapnel, it just causes their armor to crack. So I guess you can get a hit in or just, you know, their armor falls off and they, they give up because they've lost all their defense. So I think those are pretty interesting. I mean, they're canon as far as Rogue Trader is concerned, the inspiration for Star Quest. So again, if you want to use it, you can. So I'm, I'm even thinking about making cards for these. Okay, welcome to Lakeley. Visitor here. 
Sorry things are, we're a little slow getting started here, but uh, there's, there's a lot of topics we can talk about. So we're talking about uh, German StarQuest and just little things. So here's some pictures. Oh yeah, the Neuro Disruptor. So it's a strange crystalline alien pistol that causes confusion and non-lethal disabling state. Now I don't have miniatures for any of these, but they are part of Warhammer. Uh, Warhammer 40k through Rogue Trader, so miniatures may be out there. Or you could 3D print them, or really just use your imagination. Just write it down on a card print it out on a piece of paper and say, okay, this is what it really is. I'm really, I'm not using an auto cannon. I'm using a web gun. I'm using a shotgun instead of a holter or whatever. I fire non-lethal rounds. The power and force swords. So I always thought the, the swords were like just cutting instruments, you know, like a lightsaber, like a chainsaw sword. You know, it just cuts. But you could use it as like a baton. You know, it just has blunt force. So maybe if you're trying to disable the enemy rather than kill them, you know, you just knock out their legs or their shooting arm, you uh, give them a blow that knocks them out and doesn't kill them, okay, that's a concussion, but it's not death, you know, so that you can apprehend your um, opponent. Um, the other thing about the swords, which I thought was interesting, is the Eldar, the space elves. So the X-Arch, or X-Arch, has a sword. It's almost like an antenna. Because their craft world, their ship is out there, and they teleport into the space hulk to attack the aliens. But he'll like hold up the sword, and so the craft world can beam psionic or psychic energy to him. And I guess it goes into his sword like an antenna, like he picks it up, and so you can get boosts from that. Or so you think, okay, the bad guys need to attack the craft world so that can't happen, or somehow block the psionic energy. But it's all a way to explain why. How does he do the magical stuff in the game? He just does. It just works. But you could imagine the sword like this. Instead of just being a blade, maybe it's just, yeah, like a, like a stun baton. Or like, you know, a force field that you're just hitting people with. And just wham, it just knocks them to the ground. So it wouldn't have to be illegal. So like a policeman's baton. Tonfa stick, I think it's called. But yeah, there's a picture of the shotgun. This is taken from Rogue Trader, 1987. 1990 printing. You got the grenade launcher. See, those look like cool guns. There's a LAS pistol. It just happened to be on the same page, but there's a needle pistol, a neural disruptor. Uh, there's the web gun. Kind of looks like a cross between like a super soaker and a loudspeaker. And there's the graviton gun. Yeah, here's a direct quote from Rogue Trader. It is for you, as game masters and players, to use this information as you see fit. There is nothing to prevent you from expanding or altering the material given. In some cases, this will be necessary if you are to derive the full benefit from the background, because even within a single political body, such as the Imperium, each planet has its own unique flora, fauna, and distinct civilization. Within the guidelines given, you will be able to devise your own worlds, placing the stamp of your own imagination upon the game. Hey, great. I love it. So yeah, there's kind of this collecting mentality with a lot of tabletop gamers. And I've even kind of fallen to, uh, into it myself. It's like, I would like there to be a card for everything. I'd like there to be a miniature for everything. But really, it's not necessary. Why do you need a miniature for one character that's going to appear once in the game? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess it makes them special, but you're going to have to find that miniature and print him. It's 3D printed and paint him and do all this stuff. Why not just take you know, your placeholder, like the original game, your request, and say, okay, I know it looks like a guy with a big skull for a head. We're just going to say, for the sake of this quest, that this is Sir Ragnar. Or we're going to say, this is the Witch Lord, you know? <laughs> just like you can say, okay, I know this looks like a flamethrower, but we're going to say it's a needle gun in this mission, called Mission, instead of Quest. So there you got the needle gun, you got the heavy, heavy Weber, what it's called, the web gun. Heavy Weber. And here were some ideas I just came up with for other additional things. You know, this is not official Warhammer 40k lore. The plasma gun. So it's kind of like a flamethrower. I think in Warhammer 40k they call it a flamer. 
um, instead of firing flames, how about it fires high density foam, like sticky foam, like a riot control agent. Maybe it has some irritant in it and it mobilizes the enemy. Rocket launcher, instead of firing a rocket, typical the warhead that shreds its targets with an explosion, it could be a kind of a multi sensory disruption payload, so like a flashbang. Bright lights, loud sounds, stunning force that knocks them down, knocks out machinery. The other thing is, you could have multiple clips for a weapon where you swap out the ammo. So maybe you've got non lethal um, ammo for biological targets, you've got a different type of ammo for robots. So let's say the bolters have like a pepper ball ammo. So it's like a paintball, but when it breaks open, it's like pepper spray liquid. Um, but then you could swap out the clip for an EMP style round, but when it bursts, it imparts electricity to the target, which disrupts the electrical systems, disabling the mechanical target. But you know, if you have some sympathy for AI, okay, maybe you want to knock out the, the android, but you want to be able to retrieve his memory, his CPU, and figure out you know the information, you know, pump him for information. Well, you can still do that, even though his body is just, you know, disabled. And the uh, bolters, these little uh, Uzi type, futuristic Uzis that the Space Marines carry have little bayonets on the end, little, little blades. You could say, well, maybe use that blade to cut open the armor so that you can shoot the pepper ball in it to disable the enemy. Or maybe it's not actually a blade, maybe it's just a taser. So you just you poke them with that, zap them, and that could work for mechanical or biological. What else could you do? Melee combat's pretty easy to figure out. So instead of just like beating the enemy to death with your your weapon and your fists, you know, you're using your martial arts skills you know, to uh, defeat them. Maybe you choke them out, maybe you stun them, maybe you just you know put them in a submission hold and they give up, you slap the cuffs on them, you know, tag and bag them, hit them with a little dart so that they get teleported out to the futuristic paddy wagon, whatever you want to call it. So you can tell I'm not in law enforcement because I'm just using popular terms that people use you know, from TV shows rather than for real. But if you are respect for that. Um, it's just a game or just trying to come up with ideas. So the Eldar, so the space elves, their weapons are kind of equivalent to the space marine weapons from what I've read. So they've got what's called a shuriken catapult. It's this big, long, like, vacuum cleaner looking weapon that fires shuriken, so throwing stars for your ninja fans from the 80s. Ninjas were so cool in the 80s and early 90s. And then they've got a better version of it called a shuriken cannon. Well, instead of imagining they fire these throwing stars that just you know, cut their enemies to ribbons, what if it is like a star, but it has little barbs on it, so it just kind of catches on the enemy? and like zaps them like a taser, so it's a biological agent that would do that. And then let's say that it's still strong enough to get in between, you know, the gaps in the armor or whatever, penetrate through the clothing, through the uniform. But for machinery, so they can retune it so that it uh, imparts EMP type effects to the system. So boom, you've still got your shuriken weapons, which are cool, but they just work differently. Still non-lethal. And then a little mechanic for the Space Marines and the Eldar is to say, like, okay, you just, when you defeat a guy, you just knock the figure down like he's, he's been taken out of the fight. And then you can tag and bag him, teleport him out of there, or round him up, drag him back to the ship for processing. So, anyway, that's kind of a, a little uh, rundown of what could be the first mod that I would be making for Space Crusade. Because I have no problem with the game as, as it is, but... It was just kind of an interesting challenge. Again, inspired by this actual German version of StarQuest with its GSG Tigers and GSG-19 and GSG Musketeers. So, salute to those guys. Keeping the, keeping the galaxy safe from the chaos alien scum, right? <laughs> Still waiting for my game. It probably won't arrive for two more weeks because it is coming from the UK. So, cheers to the guy who sent it to me. I know he had to go through some stuff. 
which reminds me a lot of when I was trying to get Hero Quest uh, for the first time several years back. The set I was getting, like, people were sick, and it was like, okay, well, I know you're sick, so don't worry, just send it to me when you can. We'll work something out. You know, but I eventually got it, and it was a lot of fun, kind of cleaning it up, fixing it up, replacing the pieces that were missing, and then making it my own. And I plan to do the same with Space Crusade. But again, I'm interested in it because it's related to HeroQuest, so it's kind of part of all the same thing we talk about here in HeroQuest fans. Alright, so let's move to the next topic. So we talked about Space Crusade and this uh, German version. If it's non-lethal stuff. So Hispa's Argon on Yielden is still doing his errata. Errata. I guess that's how you say it. So the errors in the official HeroQuest remake. And the latest thing that he was talking about, so we found errors in pretty much everything. There's missing doors, there's missing cards, there's all kinds of little issues. And yeah, they're all easily worked out, but it's kinda like, come on guys. Hire, the, hire him as a, as a proofreader for Avalon Hill, even if it's just a commission. Um, the latest thing that he found is in the Spanish version of the game. Which I thought, okay, great. We're finally starting to see the Hero Quest remake in other languages besides English. So at least it's in Spanish. And my thought as a fan is I hope all the countries that originally had Hero Quest back in the day, back in 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, that they get the new version. That they get an opportunity. So all those kids who are now grown can get the new game, have a brand new version of the game to play with their kids or their grandkids. You know, I think that's, that's a great thing. Some countries so far are getting it that never had it before. Like I don't think Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates had it before. Really. Um, but some countries that had it, like Japan, I don't think have the new version. I mean, unless they import it from some other country, but I mean their own version, their own language. But anyway, the thing that Hispas Argon found is that the first quest of the quest book is called El Juicio. And pardon my Spanish pronunciation, which El Juicio, I thought, that sounds like the name of a really cool, like, Mexican luchador. Like, Juicio. But really, uh, he says what it should have been called is La Crueba, as is written in the quest book. So that's easily figured out. So I had to look up the translation, but I think El Juicio means the judgment, which is like, oh, yeah, because the first quest is called the trial. That makes sense. But it's, it's different. It's like, okay, it's the judgment, like you're being judged for how good of heroes you are. Uh, whereas, look, La Cueva means the test, so you're being tested. This is the first quest, and it's a hard quest, as everybody knows. First introduced in the second edition of Hero Quest in the EU, and then, of course, it was the default first quest for the North American version that I played. The next thing he noticed is that the wizard starts, his starting weapon is... Oh yeah, he, he corrected himself. Originally, yeah, okay, sorry, let me skip because he's revised it. So the wizard's starting weapon, according to his card, in this remake version in Spanish, he starts out with the uh, Espanda Ancha, or Ancha, I don't know how to pronounce it, which I had to look that up, and that means broadsword. <laughs> Whoops, they gave the wizard a broadsword. Because he can't use a broadsword. He's not allowed to. Um, so he should have had a dagger, which means dagger. So, um, what else? The elf, and the, the elf and the dwarf are supposed to start with a short sword, right? And, which is espada corta. But instead, they start with espada ancha. So they gave them broadswords. So it's like, oh! Then my response was just to say, well, hey, you know, just like they screwed up and made it so the wizard can use the hand axe because they forgot to put may not be used by wizard on the hand axe card. So now he has a two dice weapon that he can buy that he can throw around. They just upgraded the dwarf and the elf. So you could take advantage of that misprint, mistranslation. 
and give them the stronger, because the broadsword is three dice, versus the short sword is only two. Now the wizard, okay, well, he can go to the armory and sell the broadsword, I guess, and get some gold and buy a, uh, a Boston, Baston, Baston, I'm not sure how you say that word. So I looked that up, it's translated as cane, but I guess that's what the staff was called. So he could buy himself a staff and an extra dagger with the gold. Because when you sell stuff back to the armory, it's for half price. So I thought it was kind of funny. I've also heard, and I haven't seen it confirmed on here lately, but uh, the Italian version, I think they call the stuff chaos instead of dread, which is more old school because you know they were chaos warriors in the original game, not dread warriors. It wasn't dread magic, it was chaos magic. Okay, and he also says that it looks like they're making an errata for Spanish edition. He's not. He's hoping that they'll send replacement cards. Because, yeah, they could just give you a sheet of paper or an email saying, hey, I know the game says X, but just when you get to that point, just say Y. Like, X, X and Y. But it'd be cooler, if, you know, let's say you send the, the card back and they send you more. Now, the cards that are in error could become a collector's item at that point if, if they don't make you send it back. But anyway, just, just something interesting. I thought it was interesting. Okay, so next topic here on HeroQuest fans. So this is kind of a fun one. So I'm starting to go down this road where, like so many other things, it's like, okay, I got a great deal on the game. I'm done. Well, but what if I added a couple extra monsters? Or what if I added a couple of new cards? Like, okay, so I'm spending money on that stuff. But still, I feel like if I got a good deal on the game, I've saved myself some money in this hobby. And if I've got extra money I want to throw at it, I can expand it. Rather than spending all that money just to get an overpriced version of you know, just the basics. No bells and whistles. So I'm not going down the road of collecting Warhammer Fantasy or Warhammer 40k. What I am doing is getting a couple of key pieces which I think could enhance the game. So what I wanted to do for Battlemasters is I wanted to have... I've already printed out these reinforcement cards. Originally I was thinking, okay, if you draw a reinforcement card, you can actually bring that dead unit back to life. You really, you know, let's, say you're, let's say you're Wolf Riders. You're the Chaos Sighting Wolf Riders are, are all dead. If you draw that card, you could bring them back. The problem is, if those cards go through the deck each time, the game's potentially never going to end because you're just going to keep reviving units. Keep reviving units. Like, because you can only win by wiping out the other army. Unless you have like a time limit and you say, okay, you know, whoever has the most points or the most units alive when the timer runs out, they're the one who won, won rather than calling it a draw. Of course, what you could do is just take the reinforcement cards out after the first time you go through the deck. Because there's 59 cards, you're drawing cards to determine which units get to move regardless of what side you're on. And if you happen to get a reinforcement, okay, great, the reinforcement card gets discarded. Like it doesn't go back into the deck. That would be one way to do it. Well, what I thought would, would be even cooler is instead of reviving a dead unit, you actually get a real reinforcement, like a new unit actually comes onto the field. The only problem with that is that I'm going to need some new unit trays because otherwise figures. See that normally the figures, they have these little things they call them slot bases So you've got the miniature and it's got a little tab on the bottom of its feet. And there's a groove in the unit tray, a little square, that has the label you know, telling you what it is. I've shown them in previous videos. And you push the figure in there and it goes into the groove. Well the cool thing about that is, once you get Battle Masters, you could use anything for many of these war games. So you could use any of the Warhammer Fantasy figures or even Warhammer 40k and just put them into those little groups. But if you're going to put on some brand new units, you're going to have to either swap out ones that you're using, so pull all the goblins out of one and put the scaven into there instead, or you're going to have to get an extra base. I'm going to work on getting some 3D printed um, unit trays, but that might not happen for a while. So the 3D print source that I have is Still, uh, still, still learning how the machine works, which is fun. But someday I would like to have a couple extra of those. 
Because I kind of feel bad depriving somebody else of part of their set by just buying extra pieces that, you know, someone has divided up their set like they're selling, you know, different pieces on eBay. But what I do have on order, I have uh, some dwarves and I also have some elves. And uh, I'm also getting some uh, femurs printed, 3D printed. And that, those will take a while. But the idea would be is the chaos side could get a reinforcement card, bring in some femurs just for one, one time. If that unit gets killed, well, it just doesn't come back. And then the good guys could get the dwarves or they could get the elves. And I haven't quite decided yet, but probably the femurs will kind of be their own thing. I can imagine them being pretty durable, pretty powerful. So maybe let just maybe just slightly weaker than Chaos Warriors. So maybe give them three dice. And then the dwarves would probably be pretty strong. I'm trying to think if they should be three or four. I'd probably make them three. Three attack, three defense. And then the elves. They're like high elven archers, is what they actually are. So I would probably make them like crossbowmen. I would give them three, and then let them go three squares, because elves are just cooler in general. But one thing I came up with, because I realized the, uh, just like I have these Warhammer Fantasy Scaven figures, which you'll see in a second. Actually, I've shown them on other videos before, so they're like little rat men. They're little gray rat men that have swords. They have their fists kind of balled up and pressed against their chest, which you think, okay, is that just just a little pose? Well, what it's supposed to be is you're supposed to take the little disc, which is a shield, and glue it to the fist. Well, rather than me tracking down uh, some Warhammer shields, I thought about, well, I could use buttons, I could use coins, I could use little poker chips. Well, I found the perfect thing, these tiddlywink discs. It's just the perfect size, and I just get a little bit of sticky tack, which is also called poster tack, or poster putty, or blue tack. This blue tack was the original. It's like this gummy, temporary stick em that you can stick it on there temporarily, and you can peel it off really easily if you want to, rather than permanently gluing it on there. And the tiddlywinks are different colors. You've got red, blue, green, yellow, and you can say, okay, that's a colorful shield. You don't even have to paint it. But what I do want to do is print out some stickers, maybe some custom little shield designs, because that's how the rest of the game is. They have these little stickers, and you stick it on there. And so it represents the division that they are. So I'll do that for the dwarves. Probably do that for the scaven. Oh yeah, because then I would have, yeah, I'd have scaven and fimmers versus dwarves and elves. The two armies. That's for Battlemasters. So here's a picture of what I'm talking about. It's this image here. So, yeah, really easy, self-explanatory picture there. So, I think it looks pretty good. It's kind of a shiny plastic. Actually, the Tiddlywing set that I got was pretty neat, and I kind of thought, oh, I don't really want to mess this up. But I guess the sticker wouldn't matter that much. I could always get another set. They're pretty cheap. So, yeah, the Tiddlywing Shield. And as I was reading through Warhammer uh, 40k Rogue Trader, they they actually encouraged this sort of thing. They were saying like, yeah, just get your shampoo bottle, get your deodorant uh, stick, get your uh, bucket, your flower pot, whatever. You know, paint that thing up, turn it into a, a building, turn it into some terrain, turn it into a hover tank. You know, household objects, found uh, objects. They call it in the art world, you know, plastic bottles, whatever you want. Just repurpose it. Why? I mean, today it's like, well, you can 3D print everything. But why take all that time and effort and 3D print this really expensive hunk of plastic when you could just take a, you know, a package of something came in and just kind of carve it up and paint it, spray paint it, and say it's something else. So I've seen some pretty impressive results. But, yeah, just tiddlywinks with the shield. It works. 
because there's three different sizes of tiddlywinks. There's the big ones, the squidges, squidgers, squidgers, which are like the shooting discs. Those are way too big. That'd be like a base. Actually, you could use these as bases too. Yeah, it's as big as a base. And then the medium-sized one is a little too big. And then it's it's like Captain America shield. And then the small one, or no, it's the medium one. Yeah, the medium one. Yeah. For this for this size of figure, the small one works just right. Maybe if it was a bigger figure, the medium-sized disc would be just right. But these are wing shields. That's Ashen's. He's some good stuff on his channel. Okay, Space Crusade. This is a commercial. Space Crusade. In the same vein as the uh, Hero Quest. Hey. Parallel Universe. $25.99. Man, I wish it was that price now. See, if this were if this were in the U.S., the ultimate encounter. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Space Crusade. If I'd seen that commercial, I probably would have bought it. Space Crusade was not released in the United States. It never had an official U.S. release, which makes me kind of wonder. Oh yeah, that's Squidmar. Squidmar Miniatures, cool guy. I think that's the first video I saw about Space Crusade. But, yeah, so the one body point characters kind of makes me think of, yeah, the first version of Hero Quest where you had every monster was one body point to the expansions, that sort of thing. So you could modify the game, maybe give the members of your Space Marine squad, you know, more life points, give the enemies more life points. I mean, because they have Chaos Space Marines, they only have one life point. Of course, you are shooting them with guns, explosives, rather than just hitting them with swords and... Yeah, swords and bows and that sort of thing. So maybe. But uh, if they had done a U.S. version of this commercial, it would have been the same exact commercial, but a different narrator and different kids. So I said, Dreadnought! Just Dreadnought! You know, kind of like Broadsword and Broadsword. Fire of Wrath. Fire of Wrath. I just think it's funny. But, yeah, there's a, there's a voice acting guy that's redubbed all these commercials as well. So I think he's a fan. Let's check and see if there's any messages. The problem with social media is there's, there's too many things to check. People sending you stuff and linking stuff. And, you know, half the time, what you should be looking at. <laughs> so Lear Lek. Looking at your video right now, do not did not remember Game Workshop's 1980s grenade launcher looking so stupid. Well, hey, if it's not to your liking, you don't have to use it. Then, yep, that's what it looked like. I'm seeing it for the first time, so I didn't know what to think. You you never know with this sort of thing because it's just like if someone had just seen Star Wars yesterday and it's like, wow, Star Wars, and they ask me about something. As an old school fan, like, how would I react? He'd be like, man, Jar Jar Banks, pretty awesome, right? I'm like, no, we always hated him. <laughs> or they go, oh man, Darth Vader, what a, what a stupid looking character. It's like, well, actually, Darth Vader's pretty good. Pretty good. It, it, it's always interesting getting people's first reactions. But yeah, I thought all of these weapons looked cool, but yeah, I'm not. I have nothing to compare it to. I haven't gone through all the different editions of Warhammer 40k to say, okay, this is this is the version that I like the best, this is the version that I like to play. Of course, on the actual board, I mean, there's these little bitty miniatures. Like, how much time are you going to spend staring at that little tiny gun that your little Space Marine is holding? Maybe you'll look at it a lot when you're painting it for the first time, but most of the time you're just going to be kind of leaning over and rolling dice and moving guys around. So... My understanding of Space Crusade is that it's much more action-focused, like fast-paced. Um, and even though, I didn't talk about this in the last stream, but even though there's a lot more for the alien player to do than like for Zargon to do, at the same time, he almost seems kind of limited in what he can do. Because he has all these blip tokens, but he can't put them down until 
the Space Marines enter that quadrant to the board. Then he gets to put them down. Now he does get to put down either all of them, none of them, or some of them. So it's like, okay, that's a lot of latitude. But if he puts them all down, there's going to be just a swarm of monsters at the start. And he's almost guaranteed to win. And then uh, the Marine players are going to say, I hate this game. Let's play Axis and Allies instead. That game only takes six hours to play, you know, or, or whatever. Let's play Tic-Tac-Toe. Um, if he doesn't play any, it's like, okay, he's saving them for the end. So what I've seen, I think the... Uh, bored but never boring like on his channel he did he like played through the game against himself just to show what you can do and he divided up evenly so it's like okay i can see that so i don't know how many flip tokens you get but let's say there's uh, you know 10 10 10 and 10 whatever but the blip tokens get to move on his turn just like they're monsters but as soon as the, so these little square tiles and just kind of moving around on the board and as soon as they get within sight so they use line of sight, just like in Hero Quest, of the Marines. Then they turn into whatever they are. So he flips it over. And, oh, it's a Gretchen, or oh, it's an Orc. Oh, it's a Chaos Space Marine, or oh, it's a Dreadnought. So he flips the tiny little uh, cardboard square over, and it's this giant guy that's like four squares. So obviously, the the whole blip thing, that whole mechanic, is supposed to be like aliens. You know, they use the motion tracker, and it's just like, beep, beep, beep. So there's this little dot moving towards us. I wonder what it is. Oh, it's this huge xenomorph, you know, whatever. So um, I guess if there's other things, so the blip might flip over, and oh, it's just a decoy. It's just nothing. Or, oh, it's a piece of equipment there. Oh, it's somebody that you needed to rescue. Like, you could do all kinds of things with it. But the surprise is that uh, the alien player knows what it is, but nobody else knows. Now, I think there's little mechanics where... The, the psyker, he can flip one of them over ahead of time to know what it is like before it even goes on the board. Of course, you'd think as the alien player, he could just go, eh, I'm just going to save that one for later. It's kind of like card counting, you know, you never know. So I guess there's ways that you could make it still interesting. And then the more of the enemy you kill, whether you're an alien or a space marine, you go up ranks. And when you lose, you lose points you go down ranks or you lose the rewards you had or you it gets reset so the alien player can draw these uh, alien event cards so it's kind of like the evil wizard cards in hero quest so if something bad happens the good guys when he flips that card over but he only gets a, a few of them i think like one or he can get two three or four depending on what rank he is and then the space marines they get order cards and the question is, if the commander dies, are there no more orders? Or does you know, one of the other marines become the commander? Because the commander gets six life points. Everybody else only has one. Or maybe if the commander dies, there just aren't any more orders. So those are like his abilities. You rank up, you get more orders. But then there's also equipment. And I think there's blips that can be equipment. So you can, if the blip is moving towards you and you flip it over, oh, it's a piece of equipment, so I get a card. That's kind of cool. So that actually helps the good guys. And then the Eldar have their own cards. Yeah, so there's all kinds of things. But until I play the actual game, it's going to be kind of hard because I'm just speculating how it's going to go versus actually playing. But I just like with Battlemasters, I want to listen to what the veteran fans have to say. I want to listen to them in terms of homebrew. Like if they have advice on how to make the game better, um, whether that means simplifying it or making it more complex. Because I've heard that the alien player has, is at a disadvantage. Like, it's hard for him to get enough points, especially if there's more players playing, and then it doesn't scale. So if you're playing with one space marine versus the alien, it's just as difficult as if there were three space marines and an Eldar playing against the alien. Of course, with that much competition, the alien is just going to get des destroyed, wiped out. There's no way he can... Which, to some people, is how it's supposed to be. I mean, you're just, as the as the bad guy player, as the GM, you're just supposed to guide the, the rest of your friends through all the quests, and everybody has a good time. And you're pretending to try to beat them, but there's no, you're not really going to beat them. In the Japanese version, they tell the Argon, or Grim Dead, as he's known in that game, you know, just pretend to kill the heroes. Don't, because you could, I mean, you have the power in the game. 
you could make the game such that they have no chance. You could just murder them all. But instead, you're trying to make sure they have a good time. So yeah, you make it challenging for them, make them earn it. But and if they, you know, if they die because of their own stupidity, well, that's their fault. At the same time, you don't want to beat them so hard that they don't want to come back. The other version of the game, though, it doesn't say that he has to, you know, pull his punches. He, you know, still to do all he can, and if he beats them, he wins. But the idea behind Space Cr Crusade is that the uh, the bad guy GM has more to do. He has actual goals. He's trying to rise to the rank, the highest chaos rank, whereas the Space Marines are trying to get to the highest Space Marine rank. And I guess just like how in Hero Quest you can retreat to the stairs, and it's like, okay, you failed the quest, but you didn't actually all die, you can come back and try it again later with some modifications. Um, in this game, you can retreat back to the docking claws and the starting room, or in the case of the Eldar, to vote their little teleporter and try it again. Of course, there isn't really much to rearrange because the rooms are going to be the same, and the blip tokens are just a way for the GM to customize the game pretty easily because he can distribute them any way he wants to. So not a lot changes there. So the question is, is the customization already built into the game? Um, or what? I know there's there's campaigns people have made out there, but it doesn't seem like Hero, Hero Quest... It seems like Hero Quest was much more popular than Space Crusade. So Space Crusade has a smaller community. It has fewer mods. And some people said they didn't like it as much, even though Stephen Baker likes it better than Hero Quest. But, yeah, I don't know. So it'll be interesting to see how it actually plays. Let me just see how we're doing. It's kind of a smaller group today. That's okay. Like I said, as, as more of my deliveries come in, I'll have more to talk about, more to show you. So Droop Dog is back. Welcome back, Droop Dog. So the next thing I want to do is show you some video games. Wow. First thing we're going to do is I just want to say that obviously there is an official Hero Quest companion app for the 2021 remake where it simulates Zargon and you're supposed to be you're supposed to have the board in front of you with your cards and your character sheets and your dice and the app is just telling you what Zargon does. Okay, that makes sense. The app is free, but without the game, it's kind of weird. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It's all the honor system. Well, back in 1991, there was a PC version of Hero Quest, the video game of the board game. You don't need the board game at all. You don't even need to understand the board game to play it. I've talked about it before, and it's kind of weird. So let me just uh, let me just find it here because I made a whole list a while back of some of the, the changes. After a while, you, there's so much stuff, it's kind of hard to find it again. So, Hero Quest for the PC. Now, when I say PC, I mean personal computer. It's old school talk. It was released on several different operating systems. So, DOS uh, was the one that I played, and it seems to be the most advanced version. I mean, it was on the Atari ST. Um, with fewer colors, but it seemed to have somewhat nicer graphics, even though there were less colors. Um, the DOS version has this intro, which you can see on my YouTube channel, XSC3, home of HeroQuest fans. And if you want to know what the music is like, just get uh, look up a song called Golden Brown by the Stranglers. Everybody swears that the music sounds like that song. So, I don't know. But yeah, so you also had Hero Quest 2 Legacy of Sorosil, which was on the Amiga only and the Amiga CD32 console. But the PC Hero Quest Part 1, if you will, was on, let's see, the ZX or ZX Spectrum, Apple II computers, uh, DOS, Amiga, Atari ST, Amstrad CPC, and then of course there was the infamous version that was never officially released but exists in prototype form for the NES, Nintendo Entertainment System, and Famicom. The PC game is obviously based on the European game and it has the 14 quests from the first edition, so the maze is the first quest, 
you can play them in any order. You can just jump around, which is similar to how the Space Crusade uh, PC game is. You don't have to start on Quest 1. You can jump to the last one if you want. Just play it. Um, and it also, the Hero Quest for the PC also includes Return of the Witch Lord. But that's it. There's no other quests. So let me just run through the, the differences. So in the PC version of Hero Quest, and I think this is pretty much the same for the other ports, not just DOS, but this is assuming that you're playing the DOS version. You can search corridors for treasure, just like the first edition of the board game. Due to the perspective, because it's kind of like a three-quarters view or isometric view overhead, um, you can search a single corridor multiple times because you're only searching the section that's on the screen. And it's kind of a weird thing, too, because you could have like a, a stone barrier in between you and part of the corridor, but when you search for treasure, you're searching everything that you see, including on the opposite side of the barrier, which you couldn't possibly... Like, you couldn't possibly get there, but it's still considered searched. And each of those corridors in the PC version can only be searched once. So if one hero searched it at the beginning of the quest and somebody else tries at the end, it'll say it's already been searched. But I think each long corridor on the board is broken up into four sections. So you can figure it that way, like, how many treasure searches you can get. Because obviously not every quest uses every room and every... Order. You can play the quest in any order and even repeat quests, which means gold grinding is possible. So just keep repeating the quest and because your gold just keeps adding up. And you have individual saves for each hero. So the barbarian can have a list of saves. The wizard, the elf, the dwarf can all have individual saves. And if they die, you can reload it from where they left off, and you can mix and match. You can play with fewer than four heroes if you want to. I think the NES prototype, you could play with one or two heroes. That was it. Didn't have the memory to have four at a time. So, this also means you can start on the battle with the Witch Lord and be, able, be unable to beat him if you lack the Spirit Blade. But you can still escape down the stairs. Sorry, I just got a little throat lozenge here. It's really dry. Uh, like the first edition, the Maze of the First Quest, the instruction manual mentions the trial is occurring before the other quests, and then contradicts itself by listing the main of the first quest. So, I think Gremlin did both of these conversions for um, Space Crusade and Hero Quest on the PC. What the manual does is it kind of assumes that you already know the board game, and so it actually gives you the board game rules first. Then it says, yeah, 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 forget all that. Here's how the computer game plays. So it's kind of a weird way to do it, but... It is, it is what it is. So they, they, it's like they're aware of the board game version. But yeah, they give you the maze. Return of the Witch Lord is included. Now, if the NES version had ever been finished and released, it would have had Keller's Key. So if you play the prototype, I think the European prototype was more finished. And if you go to a website called romhacking.net, they've actually released an IPS patch, and you got to teach yourself how to do that. But if you found the ROM of the uh, unreleased prototype of HeroQuest. You can actually patch it so that it'll run in an emulator for the NES. Anyway, I'm not going to go get into all that, but that version had Keller's Keep, it had some of the other equipment, but this computer version does not have it. And as I mentioned here, the monster AI is really dumb, so even, even uh, less intelligent than the companion app, they move in straight lines towards the heroes and they get blocked by objects. So they'll run into tables or run into walls, trying to get to you, and they can't get to you. If you discover a monster in a room, the monster can't leave the room. So if you if you just want to run away from a monster, just leave the room. <laughs> so they just camp. You know, they just camp there waiting for you. And you can just stand in the doorway and just you know, just like you can in the board game, just block the doorway and just kill the monsters one at a time if you want to. You can challenge yourself by confronting them. But, yeah. So it's, it's not much of a challenge, especially if you've played the board game before. Like the European version, you can't save yourself from dying with spells or potions. So if you run out of body points, you're dead. You're out of the quest. And also like the EU version, 
any unused potions that you find from treasure searching don't carry over to the next quest. So you got to use them before you go. I'm not even sure that you heal in between quests. I know that if you quit a quest early by just running down the stairs and then you go back to the uh, quest selection screen and then you click on the next quest, like you'll start with less than your full body points like if you were injured in the quest. So one thing I'll do sometimes is before I exit the quest, I'll heal all my guys and then run down the stairs. Then save it and then start the next quest. So I don't know. But that's when I quit it early. So I can imagine the game punishing you for quitting early by not healing you. But I also suspect the way they did it is each quest just is in isolation. So the only thing that carries over between quests are the amount of gold you have and any artifacts, or as they're called here, quest treasures. Uh, those carry over, assuming you save your character. So there's EU prices for things in the armory, because some things were cheaper in the European version of the game. So the armory is like a weapon shop, and you can't sell your gear back, as expected, because I think that was just a rule in the Japanese version and in the North American version. The hand axe and the spear are included, and actually they're the exact same price. There's no bracers, there's no cloak of protection. As expected, and the dagger and the longsword aren't there either, because obviously they they were part of the North American version, which this is not based on. So if you're only used to the North American version or the 2021 remake, this is going to seem really different to you. Using a spell in the wrong way causes it to be wasted. For example, launch trying to launch it at a monster that is obstructed by an object. Each room or corridor, or section of a passage shown on screen. Oh yeah, they call them passages instead of the corridors in this version. Same thing. It can only be searched for treasure once, and secret doors or traps once. So not once per hero. And just like the European version, when you search for uh, traps and secret doors, you search for both at the same time. So maybe fewer searches in that way, with the rooms anyway. If you try extra searches, it wastes your search, saying it has already been searched. You can view the overhead map anytime. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. You switch between the isometric view and the overhead map. The overhead map is, the, is how you see monsters move. It's the only way you can target a monster with uh, a spell or a ranged attack. Like a, if you throw the spear or the hand axe or shoot the crossbow. You have to switch to that overhead map and then click on it. So yeah, when it's more cars turn, does that. And the whole question of who is who is the guy with the beard? Is that mentor? He's always watching over you as you play, I guess. <coughs> so you can't trade objects between heroes, which is unfortunate. And the, the oddest thing of all is the wizard has no restrictions. So he can use all the equipment in the game. So not only does he get to use, as he does in the European version, because they don't say he can't, uh, the Spirit Blade, and Boren's armor, and Orc's Bane. He can use a battle axe. He can use, he can wear plate armor. You know, he can use a shield. He can use a, you know, a helmet. All that stuff. So he's not just limited to the staff, like he would be in the original game. So I already mentioned that you don't have to use all four heroes, and more cars automated. You can't attack other heroes in this version, because in the EU version it didn't say you had to work together. I mean, obviously that's the best policy, but you don't have to. But you can still attack each other with magic. But there's just not enough... Well, I guess if you got a really lucky roll, Genie, you're not going to be killing uh, your fellow heroes. But otherwise, I guess, there you could. Uh, if, you attempt a, if you attempt a ranged attack at a monster but don't have a ranged weapon equipped, it tells you the attack fails. It doesn't actually waste it. The heads-up display for each character shows your body, mind, movement squares, and goal. That's it. You do get to name your heroes. The other thing that's weird is instead of rolling dice in the game, like, yes, it rolls combat dice during the fighting, and the, the monsters defend with white shields, but I don't know if they actually get like if their defense is actually better than the board game because you can't really see it just tells you the result and instead of rolling movement dice like red dice for movement 
there's a spinning coin that just has numbers on it. It's a weird thing. And you just you press the button to stop it from spinning. But I don't know if you can actually stop it on the number you want. Or if it just maybe it does that's just the way it's emulated. Backtracking is possible in corridors, but not rooms usually. So if there's a figure that's just off screen, like blocking your path, it stops you from moving. But if they're on screen, you can just like slip past them in most cases. Now heroes can't pass through monsters and vice versa. But yeah. Heroes can pass through each other, monsters can pass through each other. Play order is fixed, as you might guess, barbarian, then dwarf, then elf, then wizard, then Morkar. And if they're not in play, it skips over them. Little scrolls of text appear when you search or tell the result of the battle or the end of the quest. There isn't a whole lot of animation, really. It's, it's kind of uh, disappointing as a game. I mean, 1991, there was a lot more they could have done. And when they released it on CD-ROM, there's nothing new in there at all. They don't take advantage of the format. It's the same exact game as the floppy disk version. So, I mean, they could have done more animations. They could have done more cutscenes. They could have... You know, adjusted the sprites so that you, you know, like, let's say you bought a helmet. Like, okay, the barbarian's wearing a helmet. Nope, wrong. It's always the same figure. Remember that quest where they take away all your gear and you have to get it back? When that, when you're playing like that, the barbarian still is holding his broadsword and still attacks with three dice. So it's just kind of a uh, missed opportunity there. And because, once again, because it's the European version, there's no Elixir of Life, there's no Ring of Return, Spell Ring, Wizard Staff, or Wizard's Cloak. Um, no Spell Scrolls, Armband of Healing, Rabbit Boots, and a Poison Coil of Magical Throwing Daggers, or Dust of Disappearance. The Wand of Recall appears instead of the Wand of Magic, as you would expect. That's the one that allows you to use uh, two spells and insurance instead of one. And the artifacts are not limited, so... Uh, I guess the Barbarian could get the Wand of Recall and it just wouldn't do him any good. But the Wizard could get the Spirit Blade and use it. And I, I'm pretty sure when a hero dies, his gear just vanishes from the game. It doesn't matter if there's somebody there or not. So there's some pictures. Not much to look at. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty boring, actually. And when you cast sleep on an enemy, there's no animation of them sleeping, they're just still there. And you can't search with them in the room, even if they're asleep. Which, when we played the game, we always just, I, I would just set the figure on its side and said, yeah, you can search now, because he's asleep, he can't stop you. And the way targeting works in the European version, it's like if you're in a room, you can shoot the crossbow and pretty much hit anybody in the room with it. So it doesn't matter if somebody's behind a bookcase or... You, know, you can shoot over tables, it doesn't stop you. It's not like in the North American version where you have to have an unobstructed line of sight between you and the target at all times, for spells or for shooting. The dwarf begins with a toolkit in this version, so instead of having his own native ability to disarm traps, he just gets a toolkit. I don't know if it works better or not, but just like the European version, he can repair a trap after it's already been sprung, so he can rip, like make a pit, a pit disappear, he can make a falling block trap disappear. I don't know if there's a bug in the game or what, but I've never been hurt by a falling block trap. Like, a rock just falls down, and I've even had it where, like, one hero steps on a spot, and it causes a rock to fall on, like, another hero, but that hero doesn't take any damage. He's just he's standing on a rock. And then I remove it with the toolkit and just disappears. So, I don't know the point. I guess the rock just blocks your path. That's the only thing it does. And in this version, the short sword can't attack diagonally. It's just a two dice attack. So it's like the short sword is like the North American version rather than the EU version. So you'll need the staff or the spear. Because in the EU version, the short sword can attack diagonally, which makes it really powerful. And the staff is two dice. But that's not the case here. Um, on your turn, you can switch weapons. It's a free action. So every, every turn, you can just like... Uh, turn off your shield and turn your battle axe on, attack, and then turn the battle axe off, turn the shield back on, and turn, you know, some other weapon, crossbow or whatever, on. There's a little key icon that lets you open a door. 
A treasure chest contains treasure, except when it doesn't. You don't have to go up to the chest to search it. You just have to be in the same room. I think everybody knew that. I think the Japanese version of the game is the only one where you actually have to walk up to the chest. Like physically stand next to it to open it to get the contents out. Yeah, you can search around corners, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, let's see what else. So more differences with the PC version if you request. Uh, I think you already knew that about the targeting explained. So you, it's not just firing over tables with a crossbow. You can fire anywhere in the room. So it's a really deadly weapon. Like all you have to do is open the door and you can just start shooting orcs that are in the room and killing them. And they can't, they can't leave the room to attack you. I'm not even sure if they'll even walk, like walk up to the door to attack you. So the enemies are really easy to beat. I mean, really easy. So if you played this and never played the war game, you kind of have a false impression of, of your request, I think. I'm not even sure if there's a gold bonus for becoming a champion. So in the first edition of your request, if you completed three quests, you got a 500 gold bonus, and you were considered a champion. In the second edition, they call you a champion after three quests, but you don't get any gold. And in the North American version, champion is just a title they give you when you beat the Witch Lord. That's it. But since you can play the quests in any order in this one, it doesn't really matter. Um, in Prince Magnus's gold, you can become an outlaw if you say you keep the chest, but I don't know if it really matters. Because, okay, you don't become a champion, but if there's no gold bonus, who cares? But yeah, you can just keep replaying the same quest to just get lots and lots of gold. Although it will take you a long time to march all of those chests back to the beginning. And if you're already wearing plate armor and you pick up a chest, it doesn't slow you down any more than armor does. Oh yeah, in this version, Holy Water, instead of just killing one undead monster, it kills all the undead monsters in the Rimmer Corridor. So it's really powerful. But if there aren't any, you use it and it just is wasted. Um, let's see. If you search and you find the nothing treasure, I mean, there's nothing there, it doesn't let you search again. Just says the room has already been searched. But now, since you're only searching everything once anyway, if there's like a special treasure, like in the treasure chest, you're just going to get that. You're not going to have to worry about getting the card, so to speak. Yes, yeah, I already mentioned unarmed combat. In the North American version, everybody's reduced to one combat die in the Legacy of the Orc Warlord, which, let's see, is that quest three? I think that's quest three. Or no. But. Yeah, I'm thinking Lair of the Orc Warlord. This is Quest 6. Quest 6? Some of the stuff I have memorized, some of it, I don't. But yeah, and that one's all goofed up. Everybody just has their base attack, so Barbarian is supposedly unarmed. He attacks with 3, Elf and the Dwarf 2, and then the Wizard is one with 1. But he can't use his magic, so it kind of sucks in that one. And the, uh, the sprites for the characters still show their default weapon. You know, the, it shows the barbarian with a really long sword. It shows the dwarf with like a hand axe type weapon, and it shows the wizard with a staff. But it's just it's just graphical. It doesn't really matter. Jumping a trap is pretty much the same. Sir Ragnar is kind of weird. He um, you can attack him with magic and kill him, which just means you don't get the reward because he's dead. But he is not l as limited in movement as, as he was before. He could get 12 movement. And they also gave him six, six mind points. Because you never know his mind points in the original version. He still has only two body points. Um, two, body, two body points is his maximum. So if you use healing on him... Because in the game it's kind of ambiguous. It's like, it says he has two left. Does that mean he has three as a maximum? I mean, what is his maximum? He's a knight, but we don't know what a knight is in the game, really. Because the knight expansion is a newer thing. But yeah, you can heal him up to two, and you never go above that. The six mind points is presumably so that your magic is less likely to have an effect on him. Because the more mind points you have, the more you can resist magic. Which why would you cast sleep on him? Uh, let's see. I guess you could try, like, if you don't want one of your, let's say the 
the barbarian is the one who found Sir Ragnar, and he's going to march into the exit and get the reward. Well, but you're supposed to divide up the war. So yeah, there's no real reason to fight over Sir Ragnar to kill him. I guess it's just if you want to, you want to try to break the game by messing around. Yeah, when you throw the spear or the hand axe, they they're just gone. I guess that'd be a reason to buy a spear and a hand axe because you could throw, use one of them as a throwing weapon, use the other one as a melee weapon. And the spear can be combined with a shield; it doesn't impede you in any way. I'm not sure how Veil of Mist works in this one. I'm not sure if it just means that monsters can't target you. But Veil of Mist is supposed to allow you to pass through monsters, which you normally can't do. So I'm just not quite sure how it works. And honestly, the game is kind of boring, so I haven't had the desire to go back and test it. Yeah, the fact that you can't share gold with each other means it can be harder to buy things sometimes. Another shortcut that the programmers took is that any special monster, like any named character in the quest, is they just use the gargoyle figure for him. Really weird. So the orc warlord. So Ulog, Grak, they just appear as a gargoyle. The witch lord appears as a gargoyle. There's no uh, chaos warlock figure. Now, they did make Sir Ragnar a bearded guy with regular clothes, but all the other special characters are just the gargoyle, so how lazy is that? But I mean, they could have put wounds on the heroes, they could have shown them a different gear, they had they had enough memory in the CD-ROM, but they just took the easy way out. Maybe it was so hard for them just to program the game that they just gave up after that. Because the 1995 CD-ROM, I mean, they had time to improve it, but it's too bad. Mummies, I've seen them move six squares, so they can move more than four that they normally get. <coughs> the staff apparently can be combined with a shield. I think the only one that actually stops you from combining with a shield is the battle axe. I could be wrong about that. That seems wrong. Staff. Yeah. The wizard can equip armor. I mentioned that. So the wizard can be a lot stronger in this version than in any other version. As if you needed the extra help, but you don't. You can find multiple copies of each artifact, so you could replay the quest for the Spirit Blade over and over again, so that all four heroes have their own copy of the Spirit Blade. So if you really want to... I mean, the, the Witch Lord only has one body point anyway, but you could really just one-shot him really easily. As before, the question is always, why would you buy a short sword? Because there's no chaos spells, so it's not like someone can rust your weapon and make you lose it. So there's really no reason to buy a short sword. I guess you're going to have so much gold by the end, you might as well spend it on something just for fun. Just, just fill in all the icons so you've got everything. And just because it's nostalgic. The Talisman of Lore gives you two mind points, because this is the EU version. But it is less valuable because there's no chaos spells. Um, it would help you resist the magic attacks of your friends if they're doing that to it. But the thing is, this is all on a computer, so unless you're playing like hot seat style, you're just playing against yourself. So I guess you're just getting bored. Let's see. Disarming a trap, but not a furniture trap that is automatically disarmed when you search for traps does not count as an action. I've even seen it where it disables multiple traps at a time, which I'm not sure is a bug or what. In the Castle of Mystery, where you have to, like, the way the Castle of Mystery quest goes um, kind of gets annoying, because you're supposed to walk up to the door, then roll dice to see which room you teleport to. In this version, you just have to get up to the doorway and click the arrow icon. It's the first I was like, how do you get through? And it then just makes you go through. And then once, it, once you pick up the chest at the mine entrance, you can't set it down. Meaning you can only use magic to fight until you hit the stairs. Which is different, because in the other version you can set it down, but it immediately teleports back to where it was to do that. Also, there's no Eller's Ghost in that one that laughs at you when you get a wandering monster. Instead, it's just an orc. So pretty generic. And there's no Ring of Return, so it can get really annoying as you're clicking 
and teleporting and teleporting until you finally get back to the stairs. So that quest is not as much fun as the original version. In the North American version of Third Quest of Return of the Witch Lore expansion, you can find the Spirit Blade if it has been lost on a previous quest. That is not the case in the EU version, so it cannot be found in this computer version of that quest. But there's an easy workaround for that. You just go back to the one where you normally find it and just find it. So if you lose it, just back and you know, repeat that quest. The Death Mist in Return of the Witch Lord, which is that little tile that has the little eyes on it and the green gas behind it, is transparent. So seemingly you can't use a Tempest spell on it. Like you can't target it and use a Tempest spell. So I just dodged it. I wasn't sure if there's any way you could attack it. It's just a hazard. While drinking potions and equipping weapons can be done without wasting an action, they can only be done on that hero's turn. This is an interesting way to do it, and may actually incorporate this version of equipping into my own house rules in a physical game. So, I do kind of like that, but I still feel like you should be able to drink a potion anytime. I mean, why not? It says you can do it anytime, not just on your turn. But the equipping, like your turn's coming up and you're like, ooh, you know what, I think I'm going to switch, switch out my armor, I'm going to equip this weapon. Go for it. Um, in the Bastion of Chaos, that's the one where you get gold bounties. It's the one time you get gold bounties for killing monsters. Unlike the Japanese version where it's every single time. You get 10 gold for each goblin, 20 for each orc, 30 for each former Chaos Warrior. So in the North American version, you got 50 gold for Chaos Warriors. You can find secret doors in a section and corridor, even if they're on the other side of the block square. Oh, this is a weird one. Two monsters are in a corridor with a space between them. Uh, one square away from the other. I was able to shoot the one on the far side with my crossbow without hitting the one that was between us. So I guess he just kind of like matrixed <laughs> and, or, you know, and it hit that guy behind him. That would never happen in the North American version. Killing the Witch Lord is pretty anticlimactic. So you can get the Spirit Blade and then just start on the quest with the um, yeah with the witch lord and just kill him because here's the thing in return of the witch lord the quest 10 they did it backwards normally you start at the stair is it the stairs or the, the uh, iron door i forget but wherever you start you have to make your way to the witch lord and fight him in this version you start in the room with him like all his guys are just standing in front of you, you start there and so if you had the Spirit Blade, you could just walk up and just hit him, and if you got a good roll, you could just kill him right then and there. And then you just have to retreat to the stairs. Here. Now I know there was a quest where two of the heroes were captured and they started in his area, but they didn't have their weapons. That's supposed to be the thing. So it's, it's, it's all kinds of weird. It's all kinds of strange. Also, um, the rescue of Sir Ragnar, they cut out like half the quest. Like the map is smaller than the actual board game version, so it's like way easier. So it's not like you're going to get lost looking for him. And when you rescue him, the alarm is supposed to go off and all the monsters are activated, but they're, you've killed them already, so it's never going to be a challenge. It's just, okay, everybody go back to the stairs, we won. Because since it's a computer game, you can't just say, oh, come on, Zargon, we, we won, didn't we? I mean, we. there's no monsters, it's boring to roll to the door. It's like the game forces you to go all the way to the stairs or your stuff isn't safe. Because there's no mid-level save. Let's see what else? Yeah, I, I say in here that Return of the Witch Lord is better than Killer's Keep. I still stand by that. I mean, they're both, they're both challenging and both fun. So, I came up with expert mode. So if you're forcing yourself to play this PC version, um... Just, if you're the wizard, limit yourself to only stuff the wizard could use in the board game. Give him the staff and the spear. I mean, you could pretend the spear is like the wizard staff. You could give him chainmail and pretend it's the uh, uh, cloak. And you could give him the helmet and pretend it's bracers. But don't give him the plate. Don't give him the battle axe. Um, only shoot at monsters when there's a clear line of sight. Even though you could hit him like all kinds of different ways, just make sure there's a clear line of sight. 
only secure one instance of each artifact. I mean, unless you screw up and the wrong guy finds it. Because whoever finds it just instantly has it. You can't give it to anyone. And don't reload a saved character if he gets killed. Start over with a brand new one with base stats. Play the quests in order. Play them all. Don't replay quests to grind gold. The only time you should replay a quest is if you died on the trial for the party kill. Or if you need to go back to get the spirit blade. Uh, you could try playing solo, so with one hero. But it's really not that much more challenging unless you adhere to the above rules. And don't disarm falling block traps unless you're little, literally trapped. Then kill all monsters you can rather than just running away because it's super easy to do that. Don't take advantage of the fact that monsters can't chase you out of the room. Don't search for, uh, don't search corridors or passages for treasure. In the second edition, you couldn't do that. So, I don't know. I got bored just talking about that. I guess because I spent so much time replaying it. So there's pictures. I love these games that use like cassette tapes because I was thinking it's an audio tape that you put music on. But some video games, computer games, used uh, tape. They're less durable than CDs. The Amiga version. There's the NES version. A lot of these pictures on, are on yield in, too. So there's the Spectrum. ZX Spectrum. ZX Spectrum. This version, this is the... Let's see, is this the... Yeah, the Amiga. It kind of looks cooler, I think, than the DOS version. But it doesn't have the as many colors, and it doesn't have the little cutscenes. The cutscene is just Mentor's study, and he's telling you about more car. So it's Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC. Yeah, it's really primitive looking. It's almost like a Game Boy game. So... If you want other choices of video games, there's actually some other games out there. So there's Tabletop Simulator I've talked about before, which is something I've never gotten to work in Windows 10. Windows 7, it barely worked, but it's something you have to buy. Oops. You have to buy it for it's like $25, and then you can download mods for it. It'll let you play HeroQuest, but it just is never loaded for me. It's never worked properly. I don't know if it's detecting it as a virus or what. But on my system, it doesn't work. But if, it, if Tabletop Simulator works for you, go for it. I just play over Zoom or a Facebook video. Just point my camera at the board and play. You can now play with the app if you've got a smart device, a smartphone or tablet. Um, there's also a game called Isometric Hero Quest, which is uh, it's just an indie free video game computer game designed by uh, Lurch Brick. It's his online name, Lurch Brick. He also made a Space Crusade game based on the computer game. Or, I mean, based on the board game itself, as opposed to the official Space Crusade game. But yeah, Lurch Brick, he made Isometric Hero Quest, which I think is the best computer version of Hero Quest that I've ever played. It's a three-quarters view, and it's, it's very true to the board game. The only thing is, he designed his own like animations, which kind of remind me of like Warcraft 2 a little bit, which is fine. I mean, they're well animated, but the cool thing is you can edit it, so you can use your own, because he just uses WAV files, so you can use your own sound effects. You can substitute your own frames of animation. Of course, you'll have to do them uh, for his character. So I'm actually working on one for myself, and maybe now that I've said it, someone else is going to beat me to the punch, but... I've actually taken photos of my own miniatures so that when you're playing it looks like the miniatures are just moving on their own across the board. I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool. I mean, yeah, they're not animated, but they're just sliding around. So they have like a goblin sliding towards a barbarian. Maybe I'll show it to you on, on here one of these times. But we're kind of getting to the end here and I'm getting kind of tired. Um, there is one final bonus that I wanted to show you. So I'm going to switch to the camera. My cameras are working. Show you a little, little something.
So, so thanks everybody for joining us today. Listen to me ramble on about video games. Oh yeah, there's another game called Vassal. It's uh, it's supposed to be multiplayer. I've just kind of tinkered with it a little bit, but there's a Vassal mod for. See, did Lurch Brick do those too? I can't remember. Maybe. You can go to his website and check it out. But there's a Battle Masters game on there, and then there's a Hero Quest game, and it's different than Isometric Hero Quest. But yeah, so you can play the Vassal or you can play the other one. Okay, sorry about that, folks. <laughs> Professionalism. So as you can see, that is a Warhammer 40k box, and this was actually gifted to me some time ago. And the idea was, oh hey, I don't want this anymore, you want to just have something to kind of mess around, learn how to paint, you know, something to practice on. So this does not include any space brains, so I'll just show you. So this is, I've never played this and I probably never will because I'm just not that interested in it. But what I do think is cool is, okay, so all these all these guys are not in there. It's just orcs. But since I'm getting Space Crusade, I'll actually have some guys like this. And I could actually use these guys in my Space Crusade game, like as Space Pirates or something. In White Dwarf, there was actually a, in the magazine, there was actually a mod where, of course, they encourage you to buy stuff like this, and then... There's actually orcs there that are like mercenaries that can fight against chaos and ally with the space marines. So that's kind of an interesting, interesting thing, you know. Or they could fight the gene stealers, or they can fight the other guys. Just to kind of show you. So this is what you're supposed to measure the distance between units with. But these are what the basic guys look like. So you know they're just minimally painted. I haven't really spent a whole lot of time on them. Mostly just trying to make them look the same as each other. I thought, oh, I know, I can make like little units, like there's blue ones and red ones. So I'm not a not really a painter, but just learning a little bit. But yeah, these guys I think are about the the right size that they could play in Space Crusade. This guy is big, the war war boss. He's bigger. And you've got these like helicopter units. Obviously, these aren't going to be in there. This I haven't even opened. And there are these decals that you can put on. And there's books that explain, you know, how to play and the history and everything. But anyway, I just think a few of these guys would be cool to use in a in a space crusade mission. Either as mercenaries or oh, there's like a the space Hulk is taken over by these pirates and you gotta fight them off. I even kind of thought, well, maybe you could use the rules from Blood Bowl. There's this it's kind of like mutant league football using you know fantasy fantasy football with like orcs and dwarves and stuff. You could have like capture the flag. You could have like, one army versus the other. Of course, how are you gonna tell like because it's not real time like who's doing what. But I'm sure there's uh, fan-made rules out there that you could use and modify to create some kind of scenario. But I don't want these miniatures to go to waste. I'd actually like to use them for something rather than just looking pretty. Because they look pretty basic right now. I kind of like the unpainted look of Space Crusade stuff. Sometimes when you buy these sets used, they're already painted. But anyway, just a little bonus thing. So hopefully the next video will be a little more exciting. I want to show you Space Crusade, the actual game. I want to show you some uh, other video games that have been made based on these games. I want to show you the Battle Masters mods that I'm making. Um, I want to show you some of the 3D printed stuff, but it's just a matter of waiting until that stuff comes out. So, anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for watching and listening. And we'll catch you next time on HeroQuest Fans. And so, I don't anticipate we're going to do a stream tomorrow. Sorry to keep canceling the Saturday stream. It's just that there's just nothing going on. Unless one of these deliveries comes. In which case, I'll have something to talk about with that. So, 
All right. Thanks, everybody. Ending the stream now, and uh, it'll be going up on YouTube shortly. And sorry about the sound issues. We'll just have to edit out anything that didn't work. All right. Bye for now.